yes, I do need a haircut. You know, we're in between that stage where it's no longer properly short hair and it's not yet a bob. So we're kind of in, a, in an awkward zone. Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I'll be going over how I designed the pattern and went about making the brocade evening gown from the Orkana lookbook. This was inspired by various 1940s and 50s designs I have seen over the years. All throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s there was a lot of princess inspiration going on, in part thanks to films like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, of course. And really this was quite simple to put together. It was just the giant skirt pieces that are a little bit awkward to work around with, but they are worth it in the end because this two-foot train really is quite spectacular and fun to wear. And before I get lost daydreaming about a version of this in black brocade, let's go ahead and jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. And we begin, of course, with some alphanumeric paper and my bodice block as usual. I'm going to go ahead and trace the front of that, and I've actually held this up to my body to see just how low I can make the neckline without interacting with my bra straps or the top of my bra, because I really wanted to make this as low as I possibly could without having to build a bra into the garment itself. I really do want to work on creating a bustier pattern that's built in for a really couture finish on a dress. I just didn't have time for this particular project, so I'm going to be using my regular block for this, and I'll be wearing my regular Bali flower bra underneath this. But I held the paper pattern right up to my body to try and figure out just how low I could get away with making this neckline. I will be separating this into a princess seam for my princess gown today. This princess seam is going to go up into the neckline, which of course is my regular little peaked sweetheart style neckline that I use quite often. And I'll go ahead and cut this out so I can start working on the style lines, the princess seams here. So this goes from the waist to the apex and then up into the neckline. And in separating these, I can of course eliminate this first start. We no longer need it. Goodbye. It is now, that fullness is now going to be taken out by this style line. And I can eliminate the second dart into the side here as well. So I'll go ahead and just layer that shut and smooth off this side seam, tape down everything that needs to be taped down, and I now have a princess seamed bodice here. I forgot to put in my notches as per usual, because I always forget before cutting things apart, don't know why, so I'll go ahead and draw those in here now with some sharpie before I add seam allowance along this new style line. Now because this is a little bit lower of a neckline than I usually do, I am going to do a tiny bit of contouring, just taking off a quarter of an inch wide wedge from the very top of this center panel here, so that this will still fit nice and close to the body over the bust. And then I can go ahead and of course add my half inch seam allowance to both of these pieces so that I can sew them back together later, as is always needed when you've created a new style line. And you can see where our dart fullness has gone here. It has become part of this style line, so the fit is maintained even though we've switched from darts to the princess seam. I can go ahead and trace a copy of my back block pattern here. I'll go ahead and add a princess seam line to this back as well. I'm going to use the front as a guide to see where I need this neckline to match up with the front, like so. So just bring that over about an inch maybe, and then I'm going to draw a line from my arm side to the point of my back dart here just to create a curved princess seam along the back here. This will still have a center back zip as most of my dresses usually do because I prefer center back zips to side zips. So I'll keep my one inch seam allowance along the center back here for putting that zipper in, but otherwise I'm going to go ahead and again cut this out, separate my princess seam line, and then add seam allowance. So again, I can just cut this dart fullness away. That same fit adjustment that the dart would have created is now a part of this seam. And then I will just add seam allowance so this can get sewn back together later. Tape down the floops in the back and the back pattern is ready to go. Now for the sleeve of this, things got a little wonky with the footage, so bear with me. I'm going to trace a copy of my standard sleeve block here, including the elbow dart. I will go ahead and draw in that elbow dart like so to the center of my sleeve, which is a 90 degree angle, which is good because that's what I need it to be. And then up here, I will draw from front to back across my the bottom of my sleeve cap here as well, because I will be adjusting the sleeve cap to add a little bit of puff later. But first, let's go ahead and open up the back of my sleeve to have a little bit of a belled sleeve effect, but not from the top of the sleeve, but just from the elbow down. So I'm going to go ahead and close my elbow dart. And in doing so, it will open up some flare in the cuff of my sleeve. So again, I've drawn a line from the point of my dart 90 degrees down to the hem of my sleeve, which means I can hinge this dart closed like so. And now that dart fullness has basically been shifted to the hem of my sleeve. I will just fill that in with paper later, and then I will exaggerate the bell shape in a moment. But to create a little bit of puff at the top of my sleeve here, I'm going to 
leg of mutton this a little bit. So I will go ahead and draw some indication lines. These are, again, to the center point of my sleeve over my bicep, I suppose, is where this would be on the body. I'm going to draw lines two inches out from the center to that point, or that meat at that point, I suppose. Then I will cut down the lines that go to the sides, or the underarm seam, I suppose. Try and leave a tiny bit of paper so that these hinge. Of course, I accidentally cut through this side, but I'm trying to keep this so I can just hinge it open and closed and find some spare paper to put underneath here. Kind of. <laughs> I'll anchor the main body of the sleeve down to that, and then I can hinge the top of my sleeve cap open and add a little bit of puff to the top of my sleeve. So I'm gonna have that come up at the center there underneath my hand. You can see it comes up about an inch and a quarter, which when aligned with everything else means that these top wedges open up about a half inch or so. I will need to add a little bit more height to the sleeve cap. So let me grab a little bit more paper here, another scrap of paper as it were. So I'm gonna come up another inch from the top of my sleeve cap. And this is how you can add some basic puff to the top of any sleeve, any set in sleeve that is. Again, you didn't see me measure any of that. I'm eyeballing an inch here, an inch there. I'm not really measuring it. It's not, it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, precise. Although I've said before, I believe that you don't want to do under an inch when you're doing this. Like you want to add at least an inch of puff. Otherwise it's just gonna look almost too subtle and almost look like a mistake. Just to be careful if you're working with a very thick fabric because when you're adding like a puff sleeve or anywhere with gathering to a very thick fabric, um, it can be difficult to gather a lot of thick fabric down to a small area. So. Just watch yourself with that kind of thing because things get dangerous fast. But I'm going to extend the length of this sleeve here and of course fill in that opening I made. In an absolutely ideal world, I would have loved to have made these sleeves full length, the same length as the gown. I knew I didn't have enough fabric to do that sadly. For some reason in modern fashion, it's actually more common to have the full length bell sleeve that goes all the way to the floor, all the way to the full length of the gown. And having shorter sleeves like this is almost a little bit more cost to me than the full-length ones are at this point, just because you do see the long full-length sleeves in couture more often these days. And because this sleeve is going to be hanging open at the bottom uh, from the elbow down, I didn't worry if one side of it was longer than the other. I wanted to actually just go ahead and completely exaggerate that asymmetry so the hem dips down along the back here as compared to the front. But of course it'll be open so you won't really notice. And I did cut this out of muslin so I could, so I could see exactly how far down I wanted to sew the underarm seam and how much of the sleeve was going to be left open and what that looked like and all that, so that I could be sure that I liked it before I cut it out of the brocade. Now for the skirt of this, I'll show you how I did the front panel, but the rest of this is gonna be done in miniature. You'll see what I mean in a minute. So this is my regular A-line skirt pattern that you've seen me make here on the channel before. I can put a card up to that. Just extended to 46 inches long. So I just added onto the hem to make it real nice and long for me. And I was thinking, I want to go ahead and make sure that this princess seam along the skirt aligns with the princess seam along the bodice. So I'm gonna line these pieces up and see where that first piece ends for the bodice, because that's where I want to add the princess seam in down along the length of the skirt. Because this is an A-line skirt, it already fits me. It's like already flared, basically. The darts of the waist are already closed. You can actually see that in this version of my A-line skirt here. It's because I made this pattern by closing the darts. Again, see that A-line skirt video to see what I'm talking about. But I'm gonna go ahead and just split this down the middle. It's not doing any fit here. This is purely a style line, just there for um, style reasons, not for any fit reason but I'll cut down the length of my skirt like so. And of course I will need to add seam allowance to either side of that in order to sew it back together later. But yes, we're gonna switch to some cardstock here so I can walk you through what I did just because these pattern pieces are too big to deal with here on my drafting table. And honestly, everything is like out of shot because the pieces are bigger than the camera can capture in this low ceilinged basement room. So I have my front skirt piece and my back skirt piece. Let's talk about the front first. Again, you just saw me do this step in the full size. So I cut down the center of my skirt here. The front will match up with the princess line on the bodice as well, like so. And of course, again, this will need to have seam allowance down this new style line that I've created. And again, this is just my A-line skirt pattern, fully lengthened to 46 inches long, however long you wanna make your skirts in life. And again, I have a full length version of my back A-line skirt pattern, and then I've added on an additional 24 inches to the back of that to have a bit of a train. So that's what's going on here. So I have a lengthened version of my A-line skirt back, but we're about to go ahead and just transform this A-line back into a bit of a circle skirt. And to do so, I'm first going to go ahead and line up the rest of my front A-line skirt that I cut off from that first panel, line that up along the waistline and tape that together, which means I'm gonna have a new wedge of fullness added along my side seam here. So now we're adding in this big bunch of flare here by closing this up at the waist. So my skirt back is already fuller than a regular A-line would be at this point, but I'm going to go ahead and add two big pleats 
where the back skirt pieces match up with the princess line at the back. So I want to go ahead and add an extra eight inches of width to my skirt back piece here that will be pleated down to fit the usual waist size of my bodice, of course, but I'm just adding in eight inches at the waist and I could add it in in a straight corridor or I could use this as another moment to go ahead and flare my skirt further. So I'll just go ahead and shift and angle this up so that my uh, front seam here that we remember from cutting off the front is now at a 90 degree angle to my center back seam, which makes this pretty much a half circle skirt at this point, just a absolutely giant one. And in fact, while this little buddy, if I fold my fabric, you know, if we can imagine this is fabric and I fold that, I can go ahead and line this up center front along that fold and cut one out, no problem. This panel isn't too wide or too long or anything like that. But this piece, either I will have to cut it with a grain line like this, or if I want to keep the center back and the center front grain lines the same, I'll have to cut it out like this. Now, of course, the skirt is longer than my fabric is wide, which creates a problem. So I can either panel this along the back and cut this pattern into more than one triangular shaped pattern, or I can just cut the train bit off and piece that on in this sort of diamondy fashion. So I went with version A here. I was couldn't decide. I was having some serious decision fatigue, so I was having Instagram help me make some decisions here. But I went with going ahead and adding a seam to the train of my skirt here. This won't be super visible. I felt like the cutting layout was more conservative when it came to not wasting any fabrics. So I went ahead with this method for seaming the back of my skirt together. And it was actually the very first seam I sewed for this gown, sewing those extra train triangles onto my big rectangular back skirt pieces. And this Lorex brocade does like to fray, so I went ahead and ran all these big skirt pieces through the serger first before I did anything. And then you can see I'm using my clapper here to go ahead and iron that seam. Also the other side the same exact way, because I do have two back skirt pieces here, technically four if we count these little train extensions that just need to go on first before the rest of my seaming can be done. As you can see, I did not interline this. It probably would have been a good idea to do so, honestly, but that would have been another, you know, 10 yards of fabric. <laughs> and 10 yards of muslin isn't that expensive, but once you've already paid for 10 yards of brocade, it is. So in an ideal world, I would have full length sleeves and I would have interlined the whole thing. But alas, unlike a real couture house, I do need to stay on some kind of a budget. Over here on the machine, I am just using my half inch seam allowance, of course, just like I used for the pattern. I'm using my Guterman all-purpose thread here on the machine with my 12 stitches per inch, as per usual, to seam this together. And longtime viewers will notice, because this is unusual for me, I am trying to remove my pins as I go before I sew over them. Normally I just sew over my pins, this machine has no trouble doing that, but this Lurex brocade is a bit sensitive about it, so I'm just going ahead and trying to remove my pins, remember to do so as I go along. And I will start working on my sleeves over here. I'm going to go ahead and sew my underarm seam, but just the first eight inches of it or so, just down to where my elbow bends. And then I need to think about how I'm going to line these sleeves. And after much deliberation and another Instagram poll, I decided to go with this coppery colored silk. This is actually a tri-colored silk dupioni from Silk Baron. I had three different options that really would have worked and matched well with this silk. In the end, I decided to go ahead and use this coppery colored. Even though I did have aqua as an option, the tone of the like greenish blue, the tone of the teal was just a tiny bit different than the fabric and I knew it would just bother me forever because I could tell. You probably would never have been able to tell from far away but it would have bothered me. So I didn't use the aqua blue to line these sleeves, but hopefully I can use the aqua to line the vest I would like to make out of the spare fabric I have left over. I do still have a tiny bit of this brocade left, but because I only had one yard of this silk and these sleeves again are quite large, I went ahead and cut the sleeve apart. I cut the cap off of the sleeve here and cut the top of the sleeve that wouldn't be seen even with it split open out of the rusty colored Bemberg lining I was using for the rest of the bodice. And uh, so I could just piece this sleeve lining together so that any part of it that will be shown when the sleeve splits open will be silk, but above that where the rest of the inner sleeve is hidden, it will be the rayon lining that is the same as the rest of the bodice. And again, this Lorex brocade did want to fray, so before I started seaming the rest of this together, I did go ahead and run my pieces through the serger, just trying to keep the structural integrity of everything because the edges did want to fray. And I sewed that little bit of underarm seam for both the brocade layer and this lining layer here, after I had seamed the lining layer together, of course. Where I'd cut it apart, this is one of those things where usually when you're doing a lining, you try and figure out how it can have less seams than the outside if you have decorative seams. But in this case, I needed to have more seams on my sleeve lining than I had on the outside. Just pressing that underarm seam open for both layers of these. And I will go ahead and like sort of bag line these sleeves because the hem is an interesting shape going on here. I wanted to go ahead and finish the hems of the sleeves first, and then I will finish the arm size off by hand later, which is quite annoying. 
but at least the hems of the sleeves are easily done. So I slip the right side of the lining into the right side of the brocade, line those up right sides together along the hem of the sleeve and the front openings, I guess where the underarm seam is, just the rest of it where it is left open from the elbow down as it were. I would say down to the cuff, but these go past where the cuff would be on a normal sleeve, that's for sure. And I would go ahead and stitch those together, again, right sides together. So I can turn these right side out after this. And uh, my sleeves will be lined, which will be nice when I get to put them in later. Although I do have the whole rest of the gown to construct before that can happen. But before I can turn those right side out, of course, I need to clip my corners here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that before I turn this right side out, tuck everything where it needs to be, and then go ahead and give this a nice press with my iron, being careful not to have the iron too hot, of course, because this is a Lurex brocade that is blended with polyester. Um, so both of those are different types of plastic that would melt if you got them too hot. So do be careful. I did see a comment uh, in insinuating that this was a silk fabric, and sadly, the shiny shiny brocades you see me using are not silk. The brocades that I use, Mood still calls them luxury fabrics, um, but they're usually only around like $40 a yard, which is still extremely expensive, so I try and wait until they go on sale, uh, of course. This particular fabric is actually rather inexpensive for a brocade of this style. These are the kinds of fabrics I get from Mood for around $40 or $50 a yard, only this was only $15 a yard. It's just the shipping from this shop is rather pricey, so you kind of kind of makes up for the deal you're getting on the fabric with the cost of the shipping. But yes, yeah, sadly, I cannot afford to use silk brocades, um, even silk Lurex blend brocades, um, because again, that's that's Dior money that we just don't have access to here at the, the Closet Historian. But yes, I interfaced the center front piece of my bodice here as we start the bodice construction, just to help keep everything in place, because again, this uh, brocade wanted to fray apart, so I was trying to add stability where I could. But I will use pins and reference my pattern to see where those notches I added are. So I can line up my side pieces along the front piece for the front princess seam lines. Find those. This fabric would be like hard to use a tailor's chalk on or even my beloved colored pencils on. So I am just using pins to mark my notches here. Keep track of things. I can go ahead and line everything up along this seam. Again, this is a very easy... Uh, the princess seam that goes up into the neckline is the easiest princess seam to sew because as you can see you're lining up pieces that are similar in shape uh, as opposed to something that's totally concave and totally convex as you sometimes get with princess seams this is a very similar shape and yet somehow magically still creates the curve over the bust that we need in this bodice so if you're anxious about sewing princess seams do give the princess seam up into the neckline a try i can go ahead and pin the back princess seams as well as you can see, I haven't surged these lines just to avoid additional bulk, but I probably could have gotten away with it because this is actually pretty loosely woven fabric, so I didn't have to clip these back seams. So in hindsight, I could have surged them. Back over here on the machine, just sew those princess seams for both the front and back bodice here. Again, trying to remember to remove my pins. We all know it's not natural for me. Some people are trained to take their pins out as they sew, and some of us were trained to just sew over them. And I happen to be in this latter group who was trained to just sew over her pins. So, uh, even at fashion school, I never got in trouble for this one. It was what was recommended. So, I guess they, in fashion school, you always use industrial machines. So the machine is usually, you know, has a lot of horsepower going on. So I guess they're not as afraid, perhaps. But uh, yeah, that's just how I was trained. So, I always get comments about it. I'm trying to train myself, honestly, not because I see a need to change my ways, but because I am tired of hearing about it. So, you know, I've, I've been bullied into it. Peer pressure is working, not for any actual practical reason in my sewing practice, but just because uh, my sewing practice is available to view and therefore subject to scrutiny. And though I was able to go ahead and press my back princess seams without having to clip those curves, because again, it's a looser weave and a shallower curve, here in the front over the bust, I will still have to put clips just over the curve of the bust so I can press this seam open and flat. And that little bit of interfacing will help this not to fray as well. Although, because this isn't a particularly like tight garment, this isn't going to get a lot of stress, especially because there will be a lining in here as well. So I'm never worried about my princess seams fraying apart entirely. If I was, I would go ahead and put top stitching on the other side. 
Um, I sometimes do that just to keep these seams nice and flat anyhow. And if I had interlined this, then I could have felled down the seam allowance to just the interlining. Something to do in the future. If I ever do make Gothic Dream version of this, I will probably interline the whole thing instead of cheaping out. <clears throat> I will go ahead and take my ruler and a colored pencil, and because I have interfacing on here, I can now draw on this, which is nice, because the brocade, again, impossible, but I can use my colored pencil on the interfacing here, just so I can draw in exactly where this point is supposed to be when I line this fashion fabric up with my lining later to sew the neckline. But before then, I can go ahead and sew my backs onto my front here. So I will line those up at the side seam and the shoulder seams here. I do have the fully assembled skirt sitting aside and those fully lined sleeves sitting aside here. I don't know why I decided to do those bits first. I guess they intimidated me the most because they were the largest pieces of fabric and making a dress bodice, not a problem. We've seen me make dozens and dozens of these before, but making an absolutely giant brocade skirt or a giant brocade bell sleeve, those I make less often, so they intimidate me more. And of course I've repeated all those steps in the rayon lining and I can go ahead and use this to finish off my neckline. So I will go ahead and do that. Now the skirt lining on this, you're thinking, interesting, uh, what's the plan with the skirt lining? Aren't you? I know you are. Um, well, here's the thing. Well, I didn't want to again use six yards of fancy Benberg lining to line the skirt of this. So I'm going to cut the skirt lining out with just my regular full length A-line skirt pattern, and then I'm going to leave the side seams open so that it will still expand over a petticoat under this dress. So I'll be showing you all that later. I'm going to be doing the skirt lining and the bodice lining of this gown separately completely. So we're working on the bodice lining now, pinning all around the neckline, lining up the shoulder seams, lining up the neckline, all that jazz. I'm going to be doing the bodice lining now and the skirt lining last. You can tell I don't make a lot of ball gowns, really, but I do love the shape of the skirt on this, so I wouldn't mind having a giant skirt like this once again, but I'm not 110,000% sold on this bodice style. I think I really do need to just learn how to do the built-in corsetry bustier kind of styles so that I don't have to worry about wearing a bra with these things and they are all self-supported. Usually that sounds like too much work, although recently I did make two evening corsets, so apparently I don't mind doing it when it's an outer garment, might as well figure out how to put them in here as inner structure. But now that my neckline is all sewn into place, I can again clip my corners and curves so I can turn this right side out and give it a nice press. I can't get in here to all these little corners with understitching, but I can do as much, but I can put in as much understitching as is possible. So I will just give this a tiny bit of a press to start with and then take it back over to the machine to put some understitching along the back of the neckline up into the like front points as far as I can go. So all my seam allowance is underneath my right hand here, pointing down away from me towards the lining and being stitched down to the lining. As you can see, I'm stopping and pausing to make sure everything's going well as needed, keeping everything nice and flat and smooth, or as flat and smooth as I can until I get down to these corners and little pointy bits of the front of the neckline that I can't really get into, or at least not without extreme frustration, which as previously established, I do try and avoid. And I'll do the other side the same way. And then I can give the whole neckline a really good press over the tailor's ham here on the ironing board, making sure all my corners are nice and sharp for the front of the neckline, like so. bodice lining is in as a way of finishing my neckline. It will be kind of tucked up out of the way for the most of the rest of this. So I'll take my sleeves that are again already fully lined. I actually basted the top of the lining in place just so that it doesn't move around on me while I do the rest of this. I need to put my gathering stitching into the top of my sleeve caps. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then I can fit these into the bodice. 
And I'm just going to sew both layers of the sleeve, so both the sleeve and sleeve lining, which of course are basted together at this point, and therefore will be treated as one. I'm just going to go ahead and set both layers of the sleeve into just the brocade layer of the bodice, and I will finish the lining layer of the bodice around this later for a clean finish, and I'll show you that step when we get to it. But for now, let me just gather down my sleeve to fit, keeping the gathering, of course, concentrated up near the shoulder seam at the top of the sleeve cap, of course. Really, I kept this design pretty simple, mostly because I wanted to showcase this fabric more than anything. Um, this doesn't have any embroidery, this doesn't have any fancy seam work going on with this gown today, just because this fabric, I think, is beautiful enough on its own. It really speaks for itself. And I'm wearing, you know, a good six, seven yards of it here. So, and I think the size of this skirt shows it off rather well. And it's time to sew that skirt onto the bodice. So I'm lining up again just with the brocade layer. And the skirt only has the brocade layer, so that's easy enough to remember. And then I'm pinning everything that matches up. So the front princess seam line matches up with that seam on the skirt that we added in. And then there's no other seam lines on the skirt to match up, but I will match up the center back and then pin towards the center back until I have that extra bit, that extra eight inches I added to the waist, as you can see, floating back here. And I will just go ahead and make that into a nice big box pleat here at the back. And I'm lining the center of this box pleat up so that it will match up with the princess seam of the back bodice. But it's just simply throwing one giant box pleat into the back. You could of course have even more than eight inches of extra at the back if you wanted to, or have less, or have no box pleat at all, because the A-line skirt would have fit me perfectly as, it, as I started, but I added of course a lot of fullness into it, just so I could have this giant pleat at the back and the nice big train. I'll press open my waist seam once I have everything finished here. You can see I have my lining pinned up, kind of rolled up out of the way for now. I decided it would be easier to finish that neckline before I attached this skirt waist to the rest of this because again, this skirt is absolutely gargantuan. So it is now very annoying to move this entire project around. So I wanted to do everything I could do before I attached the skirt to the bodice, I wanted to get done. But of course, now that the skirt and bodice are attached, I can go ahead and throw a little bit of interfacing along the center back seam here and put in my zipper. I'll just be using this regular brown nylon zipper. This is from Mood. And I'm going to go ahead and set this in the same way I normally put in my zippers, which is a lapped zipper or an overlapped zipper. If you'd like to see me do this in a little bit cleaner fashion where you can actually see a little bit more of what the heck is going on because I'm not doing it in a absolutely giant sort of bark print, shiny brocade fabric, you can watch me talk through my zipper process in this video that I can put up in a card here. And once that zipper is in, I can of course fold my lining in on itself, that one inch along the back, and go ahead and pin it down to the zipper tape, and I will hand finish this down here along the zipper tape for a nice clean finish along the back of my zipper, along the back of my gown. And again, there is nothing going on with the lining from the waist down, but we'll get to that later. So I'm just gonna leave it, leave it chilling in there for now. I did put a hook and eye at the very top of the zipper as well, just to help keep everything nice and clean again. And finally, we can talk about the skirt lining. So again, this is just my regular A-line skirt pattern that I started with for this skirt of the gown today. I just cut those out front and back with the full length 46 inches. And I'm actually going to use this rayon seam binding to finish the side seams of these pieces because I will not sew the side seams shut. I'm gonna leave the side seams of this open because this lining is slimmer than the outside skirt. And therefore, if I want to fit a big petticoat under this gown at any point, I will need the lining to be able to expand to accommodate said petticoat. So I'll finish the raw edges of the side seams, but I actually won't be sewing them shut. And yes, this is where things start getting really colorful because this is the closest color lining I could find locally. And then of course I don't have gold or brown or rust round seam binding because it's not being made anymore. So it's actually kind of rare. At least that's the rumor going around. And I did hem this skirt lining just by turning it up twice and doing a narrow hem in this polyester. And no, that wasn't fun because this is still a curved shaped hem on the A-line. 
And after trying this on, I realized I could actually lower this neckline a tiny bit more. I was trying to be good and make it as low as I possibly could, but even then, it was still a half inch higher than I needed it to be. So I'm going to come in here and just adjust that. Because this is fully lined, I don't have to worry about like a narrowing of facing or anything like that. So I'll just re-sew this, re-clip my curves, and re-press things into place. Because that wasn't understitched here at the front, I could go ahead and make that modification. So I lowered that an additional half inch up there. And then I can put in my skirt front lining. I'm going to sew that to the bodice lining front. I'm lining the side seams up, even though the side seams on the skirt are, as previously established, open. And then I will layer the backs on. And in fact, at this point, getting this giant gown from sewing machine to ironing board and back again, although it's not a long distance, it's a lot of fabric to move around, I decided to go ahead and just hand stitch with a back stitch the back lining pieces on. And I will need to hand finish these down along the zipper in the back anyway, so whatever. Might as well just get in here with the needle. And where I to be hosting a Halloween party this year, which I am not because I sadly have not found a house of my own yet. Um, I would definitely be wearing this gown. I don't even know what I would be, you know, a queen of some kind or a princess of some kind, maybe a, you know, a forest fairy in a gown. I don't know. But sadly, I don't have to think about it because I'm doing absolutely nothing for Halloween, but I am not actually stressing about doing a second lookbook. So that's good. I was originally planning on trying to do two lookbooks this month, but between uh, Arcana being so giant on its own, and my dad getting everyone, including me, sick, uh, I fell behind rather quickly this month. So sadly, this is our only lookbook this month. Forgive me for only having one collection this month. It sounds kind of silly when I say it that way, because who in their right mind would try and do two full collections in one month? Me, because I have so many ideas and so many fun things I want to make. But I'll just have to save my extra ideas and use them next time, yeah? And one of my last steps for this is to finish the lining up here back at the arm side. I couldn't put it off for any longer. So the sleeves are fully lined. I need to tuck the seam allowance under and inside and tuck the seam allowance of the bodice lining up against that so that all the raw edges are encased and I can go ahead and hand slip stitch these shut so that the lining is smooth around my arm side. And then I did hem the giant brocade part of the skirt with a wide bias tape. I used a four inch wide bias tape um, cut out of silk taffeta. Of course, that did take me absolutely ages. And yet again, I got no footage of it, probably because it was happening about like, you know, midnight, 1 a.m. sort of time zone. So my brain was probably no longer functioning. I do hem with bias all the time here. So you have seen me do it before. And I do cover it in this video. So I'll put a card up to this rather ancient video here. Here is my finished Arcana ball gown, as it were, uh, in this absolutely gorgeous brocade. Again, I will link to this brocade below if it is still available. It might have uh, actually finally sold out. This fabric was available for a little while. I have a tiny bit left myself. I really want to try and make one of the waistcoats, uh, like the other brocade waistcoat that I made for Arcana, in this same brocade. So I'll see if I have enough left to eke out one of those, especially because I have some vintage buttons that match this brocade perfectly, and I'd really like to use them down the front of a waistcoat. But I do think this would be a great gown for sort of like Midsummer Night's Dream themed house party or like dinner party sort of thing. I really need to have a lot of themed dinner parties in the future. So I hope there are a lot of uh, other quirky people in the town I end up moving to whenever or wherever that may be, because I need to make some other former theater kid friends who don't mind getting dressed up. In any case, I hope you enjoyed seeing how this gown came together today. And thank you as always for watching. I'll be back with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>